So now we transition to the book of Job. First question about the book of Job is who wrote the book and when did it take place? This is also closely connected with the question of who is Job? It is likely, given the epilogue at the end of the book of Job that talks about how long Job lived, and the fact that the book of Job is written in the third person, that Job is not the author. But even more importantly, is Job an Israelite? The short answer is, the book doesn't say. On the other hand, there seems to be allusions to the fact that Job is not Jewish. For instance, Job is said to be from the land of Uz, which is likely a town outside of Israel. Uz is said to be a grandson of Shem in Genesis 10, who may have founded the town of Uz, even though that doesn't tell us where Uz is. There is another Uz in Genesis 36 in the line of Edom, and in the Septuagint, Job 42, 17, we read that this man is described in the Syriac book living in the land of Ausis, A-U-S-I-S, -S, on the borders of Idumea and Arabia, Idumea being what's left of Edom or Esau's land. Some have tried to suggest that Uz is found further south in northwest Saudi Arabia, but still the general region is that border area in what used to be the land of Esau, the land of Edom. It is possible in light of Genesis 22:21 and a third mention of Uz, and this would have been so much more helpful if they were more original with names, that this Uz was an Aramean town, since Uz was Abraham's nephew. But even then we'd have a people living outside the line of Abraham, and Arameans were all over the ancient Near East rather than one specific place, which isn't helpful for identifying an area. The greatest evidence seems to be towards Edom. Thus, we also read in Genesis 36 mentions of Teman, T-E-M-A-N, and Eliphaz, both names that show up in Job with the friend Eliphaz the Temanite. One scholar, William Bixel, says that Edom as a region was known for sheep and shepherding, which would also fit the context here of the book of Job being in Eden, although sheep and shepherding really existed all over the ancient Near East and not just Edom. So saying that there were sheep and shepherding is like saying there were trees. They were everywhere, but still it fits the context of the story as the area is known for sheep raising. The Septuagint also goes on to say that Job's name before was Jobab, J-O-B-A-B, -B, and there are two Jobabs, Genesis 10, Genesis 36, each associated with an Uz. So Job is either a descendant of Esau or a close descendant of Shem, but before Abraham, before Israel existed. Genesis 36 tells us that if the Jobab from Esau is the one in question, the story takes place during the time that Israel was in Egypt or in the time of the judges before Saul was king, all of which suggests that this book is set outside of Israel in a land of Uz, which by the time of Lamentations 4.21 and Jeremiah 25.20 was linked with Edom. So the Uz here is probably more than likely, although not definitively, in the land of Edom. And Edom, according to many scholars, was known for its wisdom. Although that still doesn't tell us about the author of this book. Perhaps an Edomite wrote the book. That's unlikely. For one thing, God is called Yahweh in the prologue, in the epilogue, and when the Lord God speaks. Why would an Edomite in pre-Israeli times use the name of the Lord, a name that was only revealed to Israel in Exodus chapter 6 at the time of the Exodus? What seems to be more likely is that an Israelite wrote the book about events set in Edom, against the Edomite setting, giving it that universal theme. The Babylonian Talmud in Baba Batra 14b actually claims that Moses wrote the book. That can't be proven or disproven. The same section of the Babylonian Talmud claims that the book took place during the time of Moses as well. It doesn't give us specifics about who wrote the book, but likely it was an Israelite. As for when, who knows? Sabaeans are mentioned in chapter 1, but their origin is hotly related. Uh, Kitchen says 1200 BC, Finkelstein says 700 BC. The best clues are Job's long life, which fits well with the age of the patriarchs. And Edom wasn't a major enemy of Israel until Israel tried to go through Edom on the way to the Promised Land. There also seems to be no set system of sacrifices in the book of Job, although if this is outside Israel it wouldn't really matter but this still might be an, a pointer to the era of the patriarchs. Job also only once refers to God as Yahweh. All other instances are in the epilogue or the prologue or indicated by the narrator. Typically, everybody uses older names for God, like El or Eloah or Shaddai. Daniel Estes mentions that other books in the ancient Near East written with this theme come from around 1700 BC, which also fits the patriarchs.
Although some scholars want to see this book as written during the exile, according to Estes, though we have no other document with a similar dialect of Hebrew, which would rule out the exilic period. But really, even if we did say it was written during or after the exile, the real question is much more when the book is set. And the book is set, as Daniel Estes likes to say, a long time ago in a galaxy, or in this case, a land far, far away. Let me give a quick comment on the structure of Job, a brief outline. Chapters 1 and 2 are the prologue, which really sets the background. Chapters 3 through 27 are a discussion between Job and his friends. Job begins to complain, and his friends, in three rounds, try to correct him, Job defending himself each time. The last round of the three, one of the friends, Zohar, is out of words and doesn't talk. Chapter 28, which we'll discuss in just a moment, is really an excursus on wisdom. Chapter 29 through 31, Job summarizes his complaint. 32 through 37, his friend, the final friend, Elihu, who we didn't even know existed, he speaks. And then in chapters 38 through 42, God speaks. The end of chapter 42 is really an epilogue. Job chapter 1, verse 1, the opening verse of the book and the opening verse of the prologue, cuts right to the chase and tells us that Job is righteous, upright, fears God, and turns aside from evil. Job is not suffering punishment for sin. This automatically sets Job apart from the philosophy of his day, which assumed a system of reciprocity or retribution. If you disobey, you will suffer. If you don't suffer, it's because you're righteous. It's clearly what Job's friends thought, except that we're told from the very, very beginning that this is exactly not the case for Job. Job is not a sinner. He is not living poorly. He is not living against the created order. Instead, he is righteous and upright, even offering sacrifices for his children. We have an immediate clue and indication that what Job is about to suffer is not retribution. Not to mention that in verses 6 and following, we're told exactly why Job is suffering. There is no secret. This is completely different from any other book on suffering written in the ancient Near East. In the Babylonian theodicy, theodicy means a text that deals with the problem of evil, a term that was coined in 1710, uh, the righteous sufferer is suffering, but he doesn't know why. In fact, he never knows why, if he has sinned or if he's innocent. And what's worse, he eventually concludes that the gods created man prone to deception, so we aren't even sure if his assessment that he's righteous is correct. There is no confirmation from the gods or even a narrator. Instead, we have a friend who tries to convince the sufferer that he has sinned, much like in the book of Job. But in Job, we begin with the confirmation that Job is, in fact, sinless. And again, we are told the reason why they are suffering. In a lot of instances, the God who is causing the person to suffer eventually relents, but they still never know why. Sometimes the help of an exorcist is key. In other instances, the exorcist doesn't accomplish anything and the God just simply quits. We never know in any of those writings why the sufferer is suffering, nor is there ever a conversation with the God to give any sort of answer. In the case of God relenting, in the story, I will bless the God of wisdom, uh, which is an ancient, ancient story. An exorcist or a priest comes as the spokesperson of the God to say that the God will relent if certain ceremonies are performed. That's the closest a sufferer ever gets in the ancient world to an answer. They are left in the dark, and honestly, the gods are left looking random and capricious. But here we have a clear explanation of why Job is suffering. God has a wager with Satan. But who is Satan? Our minds quickly jump to Satan, the tempter who shows up in the wilderness with Jesus, and yet Satan doesn't really show up all that often in the Old Testament. He tempts David to take a census of the people in 1 Chronicles 21, but other than that, Satan only ever appears in Zechariah. Really, the concept of Satan as the devil, as a personified evil fallen angel named Lucifer, isn't found until the intertestamental period in the New Testament. The Septuagint, written in that period, translates Satan as devil. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is definitely not Satan as we know him. I find it likely that it is Satan. What I'm saying is, is that we know that this is Satan. This is Lucifer. This is the devil. While the Israelis would not, they did not have the theological category ready, just as they haven't even today. So they didn't think of this as Satan, even though Satan is occasionally hinted at. Since they didn't have the category, some scholars have simply said we should leave this as the adversary. 
which is the translation in Hebrew of the word Satan, adversary. Trumper Longman believes that this Satan is an angel who works as God's, quote, spy service, unquote, his eyes and ears on earth. That fits verse 7 of going around the earth, but not so much the cynical nature of the accusations against Job in verse 8. Notice also that in verse 8, God is the one who brings Job to Satan's attention. So this isn't necessarily Satan accusing of his own initiative as much as God showing off, using Job as a trophy piece. Still doesn't uh, explain the spy service angle, in my opinion. Uh, Crenshaw, one of the classic texts on the poetic books, argues that Satan is an office, maybe even one held by an angel. Willem van Gemeren supports that view. This was a wager between friends, which would be why Satan is never mentioned after chapter 2. The story isn't really about him, but about Job gaining wisdom and insight. Satan as an office also fits the language of verse 6 about the sons of God, the sons of men, uh, the spiritual powers and leaders coming together, and Satan is there as well. Or perhaps the sons of God are angels and Satan is there. Others simply take the safe road and say Satan is an ambiguous character. Although they think he's not a member of the court, of the sons of God just happens, I guess, uh, to be there. Uh, Estes also seems to think that Satan is Satan. And yet again, as I've already mentioned, he's really a foil. He's a prop piece in the story. He serves as a backdrop to why God began the wager in the first place. A wager that, again, we know about, but Job never does. God never tells Job that this was all a test. Realize also, as Derek Kidner in his little commentary on these books points out, that even if the Satan is Satan, Satan still needs God's permission to do anything to Job. There are boundaries that cannot be crossed, will not be crossed, unless God determines. Keep that in mind because that will is important later when we talk about God's response in chapters 38 through 42. We could, in a sense, end our study after chapter 2 of the book of Job, but that's not real life. Job knows the answer, but life is not full of easy answers, even when you know it's the right answer, like Job here. Take the good and the evil. Job has wisdom, a practical wisdom, a fear of God, but Job is still wrestling with why these haven't brought him success. Even when he knows the evil as well as the good comes from God, he's trying to put this all together in his mind. He knows God did it. He knows he should just fear God. But what do you do when life doesn't play by the rules? O. Palmer Robertson says that the book of Job teaches us how to puzzle. I would simply add that it teaches us how to accept the fact that there are puzzles and that God has the answer, even when we don't like the answer. We often say, why did this happen? But we need to remember, just because we would know why, doesn't mean we would like the answer. Job knows in part the answer, he just doesn't think it's fair. That's why he wrestles for the next 26 chapters or so. On the other hand, Job's ridiculous friends are also wrestling with the set of circumstances, except that they aren't willing to accept that Job has done nothing wrong. They aren't willing to say what Job has said. God gives and God takes away. The name of the Lord is to be praised. They aren't willing to fear God and leave him to do what he will. They believe that there's a pattern. They believe there's a created order and God will always follow it. Since the order says, Proverbs 10, 22, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, Job must have upset the order and sinned. They can't wrap their minds around the notion that Job is innocent. So they argue with Job again and again and again for the next several chapters. This, then, is the motivation behind chapter 28. Uh, verse 12 of chapter 28 is really the middle where there's a change in theme because verses 12 through 22 are actually parallel to verses 1 through 11. In fact, they're the opposite of 1 through 11. In verses 1 through 11, man looks at all of his strength can do and all that he and his strength can find. But then in verses 12 through 22, we look at what man cannot do, what man cannot find. In fact, not even in death in the grave in verse 22 can man find out or know where wisdom is. So verses 23 through 28 resolve the problem. God knows where wisdom is. Pay attention, though, to how God demonstrates his wisdom in this chapter. Clearly, verses 23 through 27 are about creation. Remember what we've said about creation being linked with wisdom. The gods demonstrate their wisdom by creating the world in almost every story of divine wisdom in the ancient Near East. Here, verse 26 is clearly about God creating, making a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning and the thunder, 
there may be some overtones of God directing these forces rather than creating them, but God is the one who's in charge of them. Borrowing the common description of the gods in the ancient Near East, Marduk in Babylon, Hadad or Baal in Phoenicia, Asher in Assyria, the gods are gods in charge of the rain, which is crucial for a people who are agrarian by nature and who rely upon the grain for their crops to grow. The god is also in charge of the lightning. In fact, Marduk, Baal, and Asher are pictured in ancient inscriptions with lightning bolts or, uh, or bow to shoot the lightning bolts. The author of this chapter, though, says that it's God, Job's God, who we know from chapter 1 to be Yahweh. He's the one who actually controls the power of rain and lightning. He's the one who designed where and how they would fall. It's a demonstration of God's creative power and his creative wisdom controlling these forces. The focus is on him directing them, pointing them where to go. This theme will become more important in chapter 38 when God begins to make a case that he alone has the power to control what appears to be random. Here, it's an initial proof that God has wisdom, even though no one else seems to be able to find it, not even death. The same with verse 25, where God gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the water by measure. The verse is also clearly referencing creation, but again, not the actual creating of creation, which we might expect because of that theme of wisdom. Instead, God's wisdom is demonstrated by determining and knowing how much all the wind weighs, literally making for the wind its weight and the amount of water. Both of those things obviously are things that humans cannot do, but God did give them by wisdom. Wisdom was there, verse 27, from the beginning. He established wisdom at creation. As Proverbs 8 also says, wisdom was the first of God's works. Wisdom was established by God, verse 27. He knows and understands where to find it, verse 23, because God established it. The response then of man should be fear of God and keep his commands relying upon what God has said, what he has told, what he's required of man. This is the theme there in verse 27. God saw it and declared it. God has wisdom, but he also revealed it. So if one wants wisdom, they need to seek it from God. This is a crucial idea here because we're in chapter 28. Uh, chapters 3 through 27 are the answers that are given by three of Job's friends, basically saying Job is a sinner and that's why he's suffering. We know that's not true, but Joe doesn't know why he's suffering. So what should he do? How does he figure it out? Well, sometimes life doesn't make sense. Life is chaotic, and the pat answers of worldly philosophy simply don't work. So what do you do? You go to the one who has wisdom. You go to God, and you hope and pray that he reveals and declares to you wisdom that you understand. And if not, you simply have to trust him and fear him. Estes sums this up in his book by saying, quote, humans cannot discover God's wisdom by their own reasoning. He must speak if wisdom is to be achieved, end quote. All of this then assumes the necessity of chapters 38 through 42 and what we have said in comparison with the wisdom of the ancient Near East where the God never speaks. The ancient theodicies all want to give wisdom, but all they can really do is tell where it is. They too say that wisdom lies with the God, but their God never says anything. He never reveals wisdom. He never reveals what he expects. But here, not only must God, Yahweh, speak for Job to have wisdom and to understand the situation and why his human philosophy and theology don't work, God does speak. And while he doesn't tell why Job is suffering, with the background information from chapter 1 and 2, he does tell Job that he, Yahweh, has the situation under control. Rather than demanding an explanation, Job should just trust God's sovereignty and wisdom. The point, then, of chapter 28 is not only the insufficiency of retribution theology, but also the point that God's wisdom is a different order than all human knowledge. This is really the point of chapter 28. The point of chapter 28, then, is really not only the insufficiency of retribution theology, as is pointed out by Bernard Childs, a well-known Old Testament theologian, but also where Bernard Childs says, quote, God's wisdom is of a different order from all human knowledge, end quote. It's really the point of the chapter. Man can look all they want, search all they want, do all they want, mining and so forth, finding precious jewels, but man cannot find wisdom without God revealing it. His wisdom is not a human wisdom. It's not human knowledge. His wisdom is beyond the reach of all human beings. Estes again, quote, the perplexities of life cannot be resolved from a human perspective alone, 
Wisdom will not come as part of a belief system of mankind, only as a gift of God. End quote. What is fascinating about this whole book of Job, though, is that Job is on the path to wisdom. Now he needs to learn that having wisdom doesn't mean that he'll understand everything, because that too is part of wisdom. It may mean that Job simply understands that God is in control and that fearing him is enough. As Weeks said, quote, humans must accept divine assurance, end quote. But right now, Job doesn't get that. Job will by the end. He's on the path to wisdom, according to chapter 28, because he does fear God. He does keep God's commandments. That's the beginning, according to verse 28, which you will notice is spoken by God himself, so God would know. Although this raises an interesting question, who is speaking in the rest of chapter 28? Some scholars believe that it's Job. Uh, Trumper Longman says that Job is having, quote, a moment of clarity and calm, as we often do, but then, quote, uh, find ourselves soon plunged into darkness once again, end quote, as Job is in chapter 31. However, it seems unlikely because Job doesn't get it yet, so him saying all of this would be odd since it communicates a message that Job hasn't yet grasped. Job 28 also, at least in most Bibles, comes in between chapters 27 and 29, and chapter 27 starts with Job again took up his discourse. That would be after Bildad gives his third speech, remembering that Zohar doesn't give a third speech because he's burned himself out with his hot-haired pontificating. Job begins to speak, but then chapter 29 begins the same way. Job again took up his discourse. That makes sense in chapter 27, coming after Bildad's speech. But if Job is speaking in 28, the beginning of chapter 29 makes very little sense. The beginning of chapter 29 is most natural if Job is not talking in chapter 28. So who is it? Well, one scholar uh, by the name of Purdue says that it is a redactor who, quote, rejects the possibility of human discovery of wisdom. End quote. Uh, I agree, except the redactor part. Uh, this scholar is one of those who believes that chapter 28 was inserted later after the book was completely finished. Uh, personally, seeing as this chapter sets up God's speech and sets it up to make Elihu look even more foolish, I conclude that this chapter has always been here and always played a crucial role in this book. Yes, it was an author other than Job, but I believe it was the author of the book who rejects the possibility of human discovery of wisdom, as we've been saying for quite a while now. Really, chapter 28 forms the transition of the book, because in chapters 29 through 31, Job summarizes his argument, pretty much summing up the fact that he's innocent and he can't understand what in the world God is doing. Again, chapter 28 doesn't really seem to flow topically into chapters 29 through 31, since in chapter 28, Job gets it, and then the rest of the passage he does not. However, it does also set up the speech of Elihu and the speech of God, the fact that God will need to speak to actually reveal the wisdom. But before that, we get the pompous windbag known as Elihu. All of a sudden, Elihu, who's never been mentioned in the book, shows up on the scene claiming that he's been there the whole time. We assume he's telling the truth and that he has been listening to all that was said before. Chapter 32 explains in part that Elihu was waiting until the older three men and Job had spoken before giving his own answer. And yet we wonder why Elihu wasn't mentioned before. And then to make Elihu even more mysterious, God answers the three friends in chapter 42, but completely ignores Elihu, as though Elihu had never spoken, or if God had never heard anything Elihu said. It's odd. It's very unusual all of which leaves us with several options for what to do with Elihu's speech. Option one, some have suggested that this speech is inserted here by some other author well after the rest of Job is written. Some scholars have pointed out that the poetry of Elihu's speech is not as well uh, elevated or well written as the rest of the poetry, since there are many Hebrew words in the book of Job that are only used by Elihu. There's more Aramaic vocabulary in the Elihu section than any other and a different style. So the theory is that it was added uh, added by a, a writer who is not as good of a poet as the original poet. Even Alter, Robert Alter, seems to think that this section is added by another poet. Personally, I think it makes sense, given that Elihu is younger than the rest of them, and as Robert Alter says, Elihu is bombastic, and as Estes says, a windbag, an irascible, presumptuous blowhard, uh, as Alter says. Uh, he's brash and immature, which would explain the less-than-polished speech. Uh, Gordas, in his book, The Book of God and Man, uh, 
suggests that it is the same author and that he wrote the section of Elihu much later than the rest of the book. Uh, you would expect, however, and this is my opinion, that if the author of Job wrote this part of the book later, he would be wiser, less bombastic, and less youthful, and more insightful at that point. You would expect an older, wiser person to put the dumb theories in the mouths of the young and the correct theory in an older, wiser person, or at the very least make the young person seem precocious rather than a brash person. Uh, Kaufman, in his book, The Religion of Israel, thinks Elihu is the author of the whole book of Job. Not that Elihu is really the author, but that the author of the whole book has taken on the persona of Elihu and is responding himself to the words of Job and the friends. My same objection stands. If it's the author's goal, he does a bad job of it. But Kaufman does lead us into option two, and that is that there are those who think that Elihu is correct, that he has a correct perspective. Many believe that Elihu is correct in the sense that his role is to sum up all the arguments that have been made by Job and his friends from chapters 3 through 31. God doesn't rebuke Elihu, according to this theory, because Elihu's role is just to summarize and say what he thinks of the previous discussion. God, in that sense, agrees with the summary. Not that the summary is correct, but that it is an accurate summary. The previous theories, including Job's, have been wrong, so Elihu, in this theory, is just a bridge between the others and God. God and Elihu agree everything before chapter 32 is wrong. Others, though, think that Elihu is correct in adding something that has not yet been presented in this book as a suggestion for understanding why Job is suffering. This something is that suffering prevents further evil. Uh, this is what Elihu supposedly adds, uh, verse 30, to bring back his soul from the pit. Uh, o. Palmer Robertson takes this perspective in his The Christ of Wisdom book. However, as Kidner and Estes and Bullock have pointed out, Eliphaz made the exact same point in chapter 5, verse 17. Blessed is the one who God repu reproves, do not despise not the discipline of the Almighty. Not to mention that it is even more obvious, Elihu is incorrect in his assessment of God's actions. Even if Elihu is correct that suffering is more likely to be disciplined, God is not disciplining Job or bringing Job back from the soul, back from the pit. Robertson says, all this time through these trials, God has been speaking to Job, not in judgment, but in grace. By this speaking, God has been humbling Job, keeping him from wrongdoing and preserving his soul, end quote. But is this correct? No, because God hasn't done any of this. It wasn't God. It was Satan who afflicted Job. Yes, God allowed it, but not to teach Job, but to win a bet with the Satan figure. So Elihu's perspective, as other scholars have pointed out, may have some correct elements in it, summarizing Job's argument, or even giving some tweaking to the retribution perspective by unpacking the elements of discipline. But we know from the prologue, from chapters 1 and 2, why this is happening. How can we say this is discipline for sin, as Elihu says, when God has already declared that Job is righteous? In fact, he was chosen because he was righteous. This isn't discipline. So then that leaves option 3. Elihu is incorrect. But why then isn't he condemned by God like the other friends? I'd say the easiest answer is that Elihu isn't worth responding to. Remember what we heard in chapter 28. Remember the point there? Wisdom is only found in God. And then Job goes on in chapters 29 through 31 to summarize his case, summarize his confusion, summarize his desire for God to speak to him, almost as an outcry that is at wit's end and that his only hope is an explanation from God. And so when his words end at the end of chapter 31, who do we expect to speak next, seeing as wisdom only comes from God? seeing as only God can explain what's going on. Well, we expect God to speak, but it's not God. It's the young upstart, Elihu. Only God has wisdom, yet Elihu steps in and wants to talk. Perhaps to give him the benefit of the doubt, chapter 28, containing the words of the author, perhaps, uh, is inserted in such a way that Elihu doesn't actually hear those words, since it's the author's words. But still, the author of Job portrays Elihu as this young whippersnapper who dares to speak when we were all expectantly waiting for God to speak. In fact, Elihu doesn't think that God will speak at all, because Elihu thinks that God has spoken through the suffering, chapter 34, verse 23. And he doesn't listen to the guilty anyway, chapter 35, verses 12 through 15. I think that Elihu's placement after the words of Job, but before God, further shows that God is the only one who can give the answer to Job's predicament. Human wisdom will not be sufficient. Elihu just looks silly, so silly that God doesn't even respond to him. Elihu is too immature and too full of himself to even deserve an answer. 
Uh, after all, he says in chapter 36, verse 2, Bear with me a little while, and I will show you, for I have something to say on God's behalf. And one who is perfect in knowledge is with you. God has nothing to say, supposedly. Well, ironic. As for those who suggest that Elihu's speeches do not belong in the book of Job, consider this argument from Michael Fishbane. We have two rounds of dialogue between God and Satan to open the book, two rounds of dialogue between God and Job to close the book. We have four speeches of Job, three rounds of speeches as his friends, but then again, four speeches of Elihu. Again, we seem to have some concentricity here. We have two at the beginning, two at the end, then four, then four, three in the middle. Does that put the debate to rest completely? No, but it does show that Elihu's speeches fit in the structure of the book. Uh, I, I believe that he is structurally different in some ways because he's young and pompous, and yet, at the other hand, he does fit into the book's overall macro structure. Elihu, while looking like a fool for speaking when wisdom can only be found from God, does make us more eager for God to speak. Uh, Elihu also does a very good job of rehashing and summarizing everything that has been said before. Elihu makes it obvious why God needs to speak. So Elihu really serves as a bridge here for God to speak, summarizing all that comes before. Uh, there are three cycles of the friends speaking, although Zohar does not speak the third time, uh, likely that Job makes Zohar's speech for him, perhaps, uh, there at the end of the cycle. Each cycle shows the friends being more and more stubborn, and so Elihu really sums it all up well at the end, summarizing the arguments that have come before. The whole idea that Job is sinful and that Job needs to be punished. Uh, Elihu doesn't really add anything, just serving as that bridge and wetting our appetites, as it were, uh, to why it is that God needs to speak. We are now ready to discuss God's response in chapters 38 through 42, which is appropriate because we've been building up to this point all along. We have argued that wisdom is ultimately a gift of God and ultimately revealed by God. And that's just what God's about to do. He's about to reveal himself. Although it's important to realize that while this is a revelation of God, God is offering Job wisdom, not necessarily answers. O. Palmer Robertson wisely states that, quote, The Redeemer does not whisper in the ear of every struggling saint the cosmic circumstance behind his suffering, end quote. God is going to give Job wisdom, not answers. Instead, Job's going to be left with a sense of awe and wonder that God knows all and is in control of all. Wisdom and wonder really go hand in hand. Job is going to realize that he does not know everything and he does not need to know everything. Instead, he just simply needs to trust God. What's interesting, though, among scholars of the book of Job is the multitude of different perspectives about how God teaches in his speeches in chapters 38 through 42 these points to Job. For instance, Leo Perdue in his book suggests that Job has argued that God is a divine tyrant who is, quote, corrupt and brings destruction to his own creation, end quote. We've seen Job question God, but this is probably a little too extreme of an interpretation. Job's friends have suggested that Job is trying to be God, and so Purdue argues that God is putting a challenger in his place, quote, humbling Job into uttering words of contrite doxology, end quote. Thus, God mocks Job, pointing out that only God can providentially care for creation. Purdue's conclusion is that Job comes to realize that retribution theology doesn't work because God doesn't care enough about human beings to make it work. Quote, in the world Yahweh has fashioned, humans are not important or cherished, end quote. Purdue believes that this is God's point, since God says that he cares for the parts of the world that hurt humans. In fact, Purdue goes so far to say that God can limit chaos, restrain it, but not even God can eliminate it. But, and I'm putting words in Purdue's mouth here, since containment is better than nothing, we should just trust God. And so in the end, Purdue believes that Job's statement in verse 6 of chapter 42, I repent in dust and ashes, actually means I protest and feel sorry for dust and ashes. That is, for humans. Why? Because God is a tyrant. Says Purdue, quote, It is Yahweh who has been judged guilty, not Job, for the voice from the whirlwind has been condemned by his own words. End quote. For Purdue, only the epilogue, the restoration of Job, shows that God is just and will set things right. Purdue believes that were we left without the epilogue, God would not be confessed as judge. 
Admittedly, though, Purdue is extreme, very extreme, and I mention it only because it illustrates the fact that a scholar can agree with everything we've said about wisdom only being found from God, revealed by God, that the wisdom of the culture, the wisdom of the day, in this case retribution theology, is flawed. Man cannot know exactly why things happen, that there is chaos, there is disorder, and ultimately that God is the only one who can rule at all, and yet still have used such bizarre theories and interpretations to arrive at these conclusions. That's why I say that scholars are fairly agreed on the conclusion of the book of Job, the point that the book is making. They vary in how they get there. And I think that Purdue shows the danger of only looking at the conclusion because a lot of what he says is incorrect and unbiblical and borderline blasphemous. So if we know where we're going, what is it that ultimately God is going to teach Job in these speeches? The question we need to consider is how we arrived at this point. How does God teach this to Job? Other scholars suggest that God simply overwhelms Job. Uh, one scholar, Stuart Weeks, says that, quote, God only has one point. Nobody has the power to argue with him, and certainly not Job, end quote. Weeks is suggesting that God teaches Job that wisdom is keeping your mouth shut, and he does this by overwhelming Job with incredible power, basically telling Job, I'm in charge here, and when I want your opinion, I'll ask for it. Until then, trust I know what I'm doing because I'm more powerful than you. Robert Alter also cites this as an option, quote, there could be no real answer and that the sufferer would have to be content with God's sheer willingness to express his concern for his creatures. And if you can't begin to play in my league, you should not have the nerve to ask questions about the rules of the game, end quote. Derek Kidner seems to hold a similar theory when he says that the point of God's speeches is that Job and his friends are victims of inevitable ignorance, a pointed littleness, Kidner calls it. Thus, says Kidner, God cuts Job Quote, down to size, treating us and Job not as philosophers, but as children. End quote. Again, the theme is that Job is humbled. Uh, Mark Sneed says that, quote, God harangued Job, end quote, bullying him into submission. Sneed says God, quote, dresses Job down and puts him in his place because God's honor is at stake in the contest between Satan and himself, and so God must save face. End quote. Sneed also takes the conclusion is a slightly different direction following Michael Fox. Quote, inexplicable suffering has a role in the divine moral economy, for it makes true piety possible. End quote. Thus, Sneed concludes from Fox in Sneed's words, quote, just as a patron needs clients to accrue more honor and privilege, God needs loyal adherents who bring him more honor. End quote. God then, according to Sneed, has bullied Job, shamed him into honoring God because God needs Job's honor. Although we have to wonder, if God is simply putting Job in his place, why does God restore Job? If there's no reason, then maybe God is just as randomly good as he is randomly destructive, and Job shouldn't read any affirmation or vindication into the later blessing. Thus, Bartholomew and O'Dowd are on a better track when they say, quote, God's power is overwhelming, but so too are his presence and his willingness to invite Job into dialogue, end quote. Bullying, shaming, simply overwhelming, all of those make the speeches of God negative, which, as we'll see in just a moment, the speeches are not, at least not completely. While there is overwhelming, who is it that darkens my counsel, surely you know, this is not bullying. As Bartholomew and O'Dowd say, quote, Job does not need to know more. Rather, he needs to learn a humble and yet intimate relationship with God that enables him to embrace his creatureliness, end quote. Bullock says the same, quote, Job receives the answer to his question partly from the fact of the Lord's appearances, end quote. Therefore, we understand, as Alter himself says, quote, God cares enough about man to reveal himself to mankind, end quote, which is great. That says that the speeches themselves are the speeches that encourage us and let us know that God is watching. And yet, what about the content? Thus, Alter states, quote, God's speeches at the end have, after all, a specific content, end quote. God is not trying to bully Job, but teach Job, instruct Job, transform Job. Otherwise, why would we even bother to look at the words of Job here in this book and the words of God to Job? In chapters 38 to 42, if the point is just to overwhelm him and overwhelm us, all we need to do is read the first line. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. And we'd say, okay, I'm overwhelmed. We'd be left then with just the fact that God is still there. And then we'd have to say with Crenshaw that these speeches are irrelevant.
But this is where I think that the theory of overwhelming, as some scholars prevent it, or of bullying Job and by extension us into submission, or even the fact of revelation as the solution doesn't sufficiently explain the speeches of God. God is trying to teach and transform, which means that the content of these chapters is important. Trevor Longman has suggested that God does not really care about Job's challenge. However, the content demonstrates that that's not true, that God actually cares very much about what Job has said. In fact, God uses Job's words against him. Job makes a complaint in chapter 9 and in chapter 12 talking about nature and how that proves that God is unapproachable. And yet, as God begins his speech in chapter 38, he uses the same demonstrations of power, but for a completely different purpose. God uses Job's language from chapter 9, but he twists it to give the same words a different perspective, the correct perspective. Again, if we went with the theory that God was simply overwhelming Job, we'd be a little confused because Job in chapter 9 is already overwhelmed by the information. But God instead responds to Job, showing him that there's a different perspective. God even takes some of the words of the three friends and gives their word the correct perspective. Eliphaz in chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, talks about lions. God states the same fact in chapter 38, verses 39 through 41, talking about lions, although there it's providential. Eliphaz's point was that God can destroy even the mighty lion. God's point is that he takes care of the lion. Zohar as well pointed to nature in chapter 11, 7 through 9. This sounds like God's speech in chapter 38, verse 5. Who determined the measurements? Surely you know, or stretched out a line upon it. But Zohar's point was that Job can't argue with God because obviously Job is guilty. God, though, is trying to get Job to realize there's much that he does not understand. The same is true even of Elihu as he appeals to God's power and nature in chapter 37. God again balances this out in chapter 38, but he does it from the correct perspective, showing that wisdom realizes there's much that they don't understand. Even chapter 3, as Job talks about various aspects of his birth, God again uses those same exact words later in chapters 38 through 41. Even the comparison between Job cursing the shout of joy when he was conceived, God speaks not of the curse of him being conceived in chapter 3, verse 7, but in chapter 38, verse 7, speaking of the sons of God shouting for joy. Both days were light, but Job wanted darkness. Not to mention the reference to son, now the sons of God. Job spoke of the door of the womb, wishing they were shut to keep him from being born, chapter 3, verse 10. God speaks in chapter 38, verse 8, who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb. Again, God is taking Job's words, and he's agreeing with Job said, but not with what Job meant. It's interesting that God is listening so well to what Job has said that he uses his very words against him. He uses the friend's speeches against them. Over and over and over again, God uses the words of Job and the words of the friends to twist and adapt their perspective to the correct perspective. It's how God teaches wisdom, letting God make the emphasis that he knows what's going on, even though Job does not. Consider in the book of Job is Job's response. In chapter 42, verse 6, Job says, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes, or at least that's the English Standard Version translation. There's questions, though, as to exactly what Job is talking about. Job perhaps might be repenting of what he said in Job chapter 30, verse 19. God has cast me into the mire, and I have become like dust and ashes. Some scholars suggest, then, that Job is quoting this directly and saying, I repent of having said that. God did not cast me into the mire. God did not make me like dust and ashes. Other people have suggested that Job is repenting in dust and ashes, just as the ESV has translated it that Job is despising himself for speaking against God. It's also possible, though, that Job is repenting, but he's repenting of the fact that he is dust and ashes, that he's basically saying, I do not understand, referencing what Abraham says in Genesis 18, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. And so it's possible that Job is saying, I'm a human, forgive me for not knowing of things that I speak. Forgive me for my limited knowledge. Forgive me for attempting to understand the things of God when they're too marvelous for me. Instead, it might be Job simply saying, I'm a human and I have to trust God in this. Again, this continues to be debated as to what exactly Job means when he says dust and ashes, but those are at least a few of the options.
the book ends with Job getting stuff back, but he gets back different things. He gets back different children. It makes you wonder if Job could ever really have gotten over the pain of losing his original children, even though he had some beautiful children afterwards. Well, this ends our first lecture. I look forward to discussing all this with you in class.